Well, so that that gives me chills because the fact that there was some sort of light coming off UFO over some grave. Right. 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 Welcome back to Midnight Mysteries, the heart of Canadian Paranormal Radio. My name is Nathan. Tonight we're talking about the Mount Pleasant Cemetery. Have you heard of multiple witnesses and news coverage of UFO sightings over a large city graveyard before? Today we have you covered. We're also going to be talking about the history of Mount Pleasant Cemetery and some of the paranormal instances surrounding it. If you want to learn more about these kind of topics, like ghosts, the paranormal, spooky places, UFOs and more, remember to click subscribe. We're out with Erica and Mike. Erica is a host of Erica's Ghost Stories, a podcast exploring the histories of people, places, and things that are haunted. The unusually unknown. Paranormal activities and mysteries. She covers it all. Erica has been with us a couple times before, and we're excited about collaborating with her again. And of course, you guys know big old Mike. Mike, to get us started, give us a, a Cliff Notes overview of the history of the Mount Pleasant Cemetery. Yeah, we're here at Mount Pleasant Cemetery, which is located in Edmonton, Alberta, in the Pleasant View neighborhood. Uh, this location has a rich history of for many different types of people. Um, it's located on a hill called a came, which is basically a scientific way of saying it's a hill formed by the glaciers retreating from this area. In times long past, indigenous people frequented this hill. Uh, they used it as a lookout, a camp, a general gathering spot, and there's lots of archaeological findings to support this. Um, one of the, one of the kind of quirky, odd reasons the indigenous used this hill, which I thought was kind of interesting, was they actually used it for bug repellent. Because being up on the hill, so these big trees you see around us are all planted here. Uh, long time ago when they made the cemetery but before then it was mostly bare if you look back at the uh some of the old photos uh, from the archives you can see it was quite bare trees were small so why would it repel the bugs so yeah so so because there was no trees the wind would blow through here quite hard and blow the bugs away and i was like hmm. i've always wondered how ancient peoples <laughs> dealt with the bugs because i can imagine it would be insane at some times regardless though in, in 1899 uh, David and Margaret Martin and their 11 kids settled here. Uh, they built a farm and, and started their life here. But unfortunately, within the first few years, David himself and uh, one of his daughters passed away. Um, and they were actually probably one of the first uh, people buried here. And then shortly after that, in the early 1900s, the location uh, became Mount Pleasant Cemetery. Uh, and, and once again, for the location of being up on a hill and being in a place, you know, close to the heavens it was it was chosen to be uh, a cemetery kind of an interesting few interesting little things here a lot of history to this place so i know you did a lot of research into it erica so why don't you take it away um i ha i have done some research and it goes back As she pulls out her her you know a book of notes that she's <laughs> ancient <laughs> I've, done, I've done some research just a little <laughs> Yeah, and it was. Uh, it's said that it has a bit of a dark history um, without some written records. Um, so kind of some unknown stuff as well. Um, we did touch base with a local source that said that uh, he knows the graveyard quite well and um, that he confirms that no one really likes the area due to feeling dizzy and disoriented while they walk through. He claims that most visitors have the feeling of being watched and the area with the most activity is the southern parts of the graveyard, which is to our left. Um, I'll be looking over my shoulder yeah, from now on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, uh, just 
check it out. You never know. And also, we're recording this, so maybe there's something in the background. That if we don't make it back alive, yeah. watch the tapes <laughs> You'll first. You'll know. Yeah, we'll have uh, video recordings. So, uh, apparently, the graveyard shows visual tricks. Some say some shimmer in the distance, like glowing orbs. Others say that there's a weird shadow light. Um, and there's, like, there's a lot of little stories like that. It could be glowing ghost lights maybe it's attributed to the houses around but it just some of the stories it, it's just odd where the lights are situated yeah. or the orbs it's interesting that you say that nathan and i were here uh it was it last winter i think we were just walking around uh, and we were taking some video and i as i was going through the video there was a weird kind of like it wasn't like a an orb, but some something a wisp of something came by on the camera, and we actually recorded that. And Mike and I are super, super, super skeptical of orbs in footage because a lot of it yeah. is usually dust particles. Dust, yeah, yeah. and like <clears throat> the dust particles catching the light. But this was this was a bit more pronounced, and you know that was before we really got into the history and how people reported these items shimmering in the distance and and these glowing orbs. Part of me wonders is is with the rainfall when it hits or with the the thawing if it's ever washed some of the graves downhill too, um, or if there's ever been flooding here that have, has disturbed a bit of the the resting places for this because even right along the fence line of the cemetery because there's a neighborhood surrounding it right along the the fence line there's gravestones and grave markers and it's it's quite easy to step on graves as you're navigating through here so definitely lots of activity here before yeah and apparently recorded activity maybe we'll insert the light the the orb in this yeah. i don't know maybe that would be really interesting to see i haven't experienced anything being here um but one of the ghost stories apparently is um involves children apparitions near certain tombstones and like people have he heard them giggle and like little feet running around and they it's like they want to get your attention so a that was also from the local source um and so they were they were also offered to cross over but apparently they are attached to something or someone here so they're not ready to cross over just yet but multiple witnesses have have seen there used to be a tour at the mount pleasant graveyard so like a ghost tour mm -hmm. and so people have said that during those tours and this this local source that help confirm some of this stuff he used to be one of the people that led these tours yeah. but he he and we'll keep him anonymous but he didn't want to come back here for the episode because of the stuff he found he brought home with him when doing the the graveyard tours and just did not find it pleasant to be around this this energy for too long well and remember we had that uh that case where someone came to us because they were experiencing something in their home and it was right after they had walked through this graveyard. Oh, right. Yeah. I just remembered that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was... Uh, what was their experience? So the, the uh, one of the kids in the house, he walked through here, you know, felt like he was being watched or followed, but didn't... Uh, I don't think he saw anything at that point. Um, and then when he went home, he saw like an apparition of something. And, it, and he wouldn't go in the house for a while and, and was quite uh, afraid of it. And that's when they reached out to us and asked us to come and... and uh, have a chat. Have a chat and pray through the house with them and stuff. And anyways, it, thankfully, you know, thank God that worked for them. And, yeah. And they were great after. But yeah, it was, he said it was after he walked through here. Oh, interesting. I know somebody who calls them Klingons, and that always reminds uh. me of Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. So I, I hate that word, Klingons. More, maybe more like attached, yeah. Att or attachments. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes um, that can happen, right? Mm. Um, on a weaker level, maybe, or a non-awareness level. Yeah. Um, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Who knows is right. <laughs> Some of those things you just can't know well, yeah. what happened exactly. Um, so like another of these stories, a ghost story would be an apparition of a woman in a white dress wandering after sunset into the night, searching for her lost child. Again, a story surrounding a child or children. Mm -hmm. um, so 
Um, yeah, and, and it said that this woman's child had an unmarked grave somewhere in the cemetery. I find it fascinating that so many of these stories involve like women in white. Or yeah, things. I was and, just thinking the same thing. Actually. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, like, I, I believe with mm, most legends, there's some sort of root and some sort of firsthand experience. And so I'm wondering, you know, maybe it's just become a stereotype, but maybe there's something symbolic too. Maybe it's because, you know, there was purity involved and there was like this, this soul or spirit has become lost because of, you know, attachments that haven't mm-hmm. been dealt with or who knows where that originated yeah, from it's interesting to think about yeah because I, I was thinking the exact same thing as you i was like yeah i sure hear a lot about yeah like a woman in a white dress yeah. or, or something like that well and every time we hear about something that's common like that there's got to be a history or a story behind kind of an innocent feminine energy being attached or or not being able to cross over and in this case of course it was um the child's unmarked grave um so Mm -hmm. um and i hear of another of other cases where it's um you know maybe like at the princess theater or um the jasper um sorry the banff springs hotel there's a couple of you know that come out to mind yeah as well so it's like it's something that happened in history that's really kind of rooted in what happened in been imprinted yeah yeah. imprinted in that history of what anyways so that's interesting too um along with this apparition comes cold spots and faints of cries um but it is in the older section of the cemetery as we said like to the left so southern of the cemetery as we all look over to (laughs) Hmm. just checking just checking we are here uh, pretty in the daytime so (laughs) i'm not sure i'm definitely feeling a cold spot i mean yeah it is it's cold. Uh, it's october cold. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah uh yeah there's another popular legend that talks about flickering uh lights amongst clusters of trees especially on foggy nights some people believe that the flickering art spirits um, are early settlers, maybe um, soldiers from World War One, many of whom were actually bur- buried in this cemetery. So quite interesting. And speaking of one of the things that caught us off guard was we had told one of our listeners we were we were going to be filming here. And he's like, oh, you're going to be covering the UFO sightings. And I'm like, what UFO sightings? And he grew up in this area and he's like, oh, uh, there was coverage from the Edmonton Journal in, in the 1960s about this UFO sighting. So, Erica, yes. you know, our journalist for today, why don't you take us into that? Yeah. So, back in 1967, so yeah, the 60s, uh, a 14-year-old boy claimed to watch an unidentified flying object for four hours. Wow. Provided the most detailed report um, of any UFO sightings in Edmonton. Of course, he went to the Edmonton Journal, and he said it, it was mostly in the graveyard. And it was in the middle of the night, uh, prob- approximately about 2 a.m. He saw a white-beamed light over several blocks, uh, which he followed before it disappeared. Once he got back to his home, it appeared again. Anyways, he walks over to his friend's house, Glenn, Glenn Coates, and they both got binoculars and they both watched this UFO sighting for quite some time. Eventually, Glenn went home and Ricky still couldn't go to bed, couldn't sleep, so he kept following it until it disappeared. Uh, Ricky described the events v- with details accompanied by a drawing that. And we'll put this drawing w- up. We for, absolutely for will. Viewers. Yeah, so, um, and then, so, in his description, he said there was a spherical-shaped ship with red and green lights. The top and bottom of the ship spun really fast. Um, It made a muffled whistling noise when it hovered. And there was a bright light coming from the bottom that spread into a rectangular shape of 15 centimeters above well, the ground. So that, that gives me chills because you know what I love about these earlier UFO settings is people didn't have Reddit yeah. or Google <laughs> exactly. to go in and see these um, UFO yeah. common characteristics. Yeah. And so just the fact that he was able to to describe what was uh, has become a popular uh, description of UFOs just is yeah is wild but what gave me chills was the fact that there was some sort of light coming off the ufo would have been over some grave 
Right. 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 Yeah, I, I was just thinking the same thing. I was like, it's so interesting how over the years, the descriptions are fairly similar. Like, they're not copycat, but they're pretty similar, right? Yeah. And like, I mean, this yep. was back in the 60s. And one could say, well, that's a good story for a journal. But there were multiple people after this that had seen it weeks afterwards. So, of course, he said it was like two or 300 meters from the ground. So it's quite high up. Um, but he said right before it left, there was about seven or eight bangs, big bangs, and then it took off. So, um, and sorry, just really quick. This yeah. is prior to when like consumer drones are around before military drones oh, yeah. are around. Uh, this is yeah. like, yeah. yeah, this is where the closest thing with hovering capabilities would have been a, a helicopter of the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he heard bangs? Yeah, he heard bangs inside of the UFO, like, yeah, seven or eight, and then poof, disappeared. Um, and again, he claims it was a four-hour ordeal, so I could imagine that he was, like, invested in this. Yeah, I mean, that, that lends to the credibility of it, because, I mean, most sightings are like, oh, yeah, I saw something shoot like by, quick. but, yeah. like, four hours to take in what you're seeing, get a friend, get binoculars, mm -hmm. like... That's that's quite something. And then more people ended up going on to see it, you said. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Joseph LaForge, he was the cemetery cemetery foreman at the time. Uh, he did witness the next day marks on the gravel, which were very unusual. Uh, they didn't come from a car. They didn't come from an animal. So uh, he that was a, a key witness to what Ricky and Glenn saw. Um, Ricky's story att attracted people to Mount Pleasant. Uh, and two days later, a middle-aged couple named Vince and Kate that lived in the area um, saw an object with red and green flashing lights with a bright light on underneath it hovering. Uh, and it had vanished instantly. Uh, Kate called the journal. The UFO reappeared five minutes later and again disappeared. And then Kate made a second call to the paper. And the names are anonymous because they didn't want to come off crazy. So that's why I called them Kate and Vince. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so they didn't want to come off crazy at all. So they, it was an anonymous call to the journal, two anonymous calls, right two days or a couple days after Ricky and Glenn Names saw. withheld to protect the, the survivors. <laughs> yeah, and they, yeah, I mean, the neighborhoods were probably so small at that time that yeah. they would know who those people were. Right. And then 10 days later, Norman uh, Fibg, uh, who worked in the area, described a really bright egg-shaped object with two red lights at the end hovering at a distance of a plane and swears it was not a plane. Um, the ship then came down really fast and then headed west, which actually we are facing west. So, um, yeah. So and then and then the fourth, I guess, sixth person would be um, Jack Strangman, a school janitor, um, reported seeing a white oval shaped object through his binoculars close to midnight at the cemetery. So at this point, like literally with the foreman, there had been six witnesses um, within two weeks. And these aren't, you know, these aren't UFO hunters or paranormal investigators <laughs> that are out Those didn't looking exist. for In stuff. In the 60s, yeah, It's exactly. like these people are... Um, these people are just out and about their everyday lives and it's yeah. like saw something unusual, something strange and extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, typically I look at, um, you know, there's an initial sighting and then there's a slew of ones that follow that. And, and, you know, the, the credibility goes down a little bit, but at the same time, you know, when someone hears about that, all of a sudden they're paying attention more. Mm -hmm. Like if they're walking through here, maybe they're not, you know, looking up at the sky. But yeah. once they hear the story, you know, all of a sudden they're like, okay, what's that? What's that? You know, and so then, and then that's, you know, one of the reasons why we get more sightings after an initial one. Yeah. And the Edmonton Journal isn't, you know, a tabloid newspaper no, either. Especially so they, back then. Yeah. They felt there was some sort of credibility to the story to, to print it. Yeah. There must have been, hey. This wasn't a digital article that they could throw up for pennies to yeah. host on their server. This was yeah. printed, costly material. Yeah, clickbait so. wasn't a thing, really. No. Yeah, I and mean, it's not like they just, oh, they had a section on their newspaper that was like UFO sightings. Like, yeah. it was, like, yeah. obviously <laughs> yeah. odd. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's a, it's not off topic, I guess, but it makes me think of the whole, you know, early, early on in the, 
the history I was I was sharing um, talked about being close to the heavens, being on the top of a hill, and that's something that goes back to ancient times. Even you know, even in the Bible, it talks about like you know being up on a high place to meet with God, like things like that. And so mountains. And yeah, there's there really is something interesting about mystical. high places you know mm-hmm. and yeah sure is this a massive hill no but given the surrounding areas it is a high place amongst the surrounding yeah erica you were you were going into it a bit earlier about this being the highest point in edmonton yeah in so well and uh not only that but of course alberta has some of the highest points in canada and to zoom in on this was one of the highest points in edmonton um, so we're above sea quite a lot, yeah. th- like thousands of feet, right? So uh, that's interesting too. We are yeah. closer to the sky. Uh, a number of years ago, um, I was listening to one of Edmonton's four mayors talk about how people have always been drawn to this part of the River Valley. They've mm-hmm. always been drawn to this part of of the province from First Nations groups to settlers and et cetera. So there's something intrinsically mystical about this place and okay so for those of you that don't know which is probably everybody listening (laughs) nathan knows i'm like a weather geek i (laughs) study i study the models yeah i study the models like i do my own forecast i was going to school at one point to be a meteorologist but didn't want to do it for work but it remained my hobby and still is um and so so you talk about like something drew people here um there's something very central about Edmonton. Even even geographically, you look at a uh, map of Alberta, it's like pretty much dead center. Yeah. Um, and even with weather systems, it's like we're in this weird area where things go like around us quite often. It's like we're in this very central location. Uh, and I think all that, you know, I really do think the physical mirrors the spiritual world. Yeah. Like I don't think the spiritual world mirrors the physical world mm-hmm. per se. It does, but... The spiritual world is is the I think the bigger world. The so, outcome or the, right. di- yeah. the dimension away from yeah, us like right. dimensions away that's from that's older than our world, right? Yeah. 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 So I really do think you know, simple things in the physical sometimes can yeah. be a symbol of something spiritual too. And just to add to that, Amiskwiskaiken, uh, which is Edmonton, um, used to be a very much a place where Indigenous uh, communities met. Yeah. Different, right. like Cree with uh, Blackfoot. And uh, so um, way before settler times, mm-hmm. um, it, it had that energy and it, it continues to. That river and that er- this specific area of the river is very powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and like we said earlier too, that this hill in particular too was a, a meeting area. You know, camping, uh, lots of indigenous camped here and yeah. met here and looked out, looked out over the surroundings. Yeah, it's a it's a very it's a special place, and so yeah, you know, I'm not totally surprised that there's some weird things that go on, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I love how um, you know, there the estimates for when indigenous groups were here keeps growing longer and longer. Yeah. Like oh. It's now thousands of years ago. Yeah. It's not just a few yeah. hundred. It's yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're finding more and more evidence that it was quite stretched quite a ways back. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing I wanted to add, uh, this story about the UFO, the way we learned about it initially, right, was through somebody bringing it to our attention. And so I just want to put it out there for, for all of you watching. Like, if you know some really interesting stories or, or legends or sightings that have happened you know, here in Alberta somewhere, let us know because we would love to dig into it. And or see. even in Canada, like, yeah, please even, bring it exactly. forward and we'd love to cover it. Yeah, we'll go to Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's Reese Field trip. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I just wanted to put that out there because that's that's how you, you know, you find a lot of the cool stories is just talking to people. So yeah. yeah. Or, or let if us you have your own personal story, um, yeah. let us know. Did you or someone you know ever encounter a a UFO or experience any sort of UFO phenomena? We'd love to connect with you. Send us a message or add your thoughts and comments below and we'll respond right back. Thanks for joining us. Remember, stay weird and we'll see you next time on Midnight Mysteries. Have a good night.